Hi, this is Jonathan Gardner, and I'm covering Schroeder's An Introduction to Thermal Physics. This is Chapter 2, The Second Law, which has to do with entropy and an understanding of entropy. And this is the first section talking about two-state systems. Now, he starts by talking about coin flips and how to count probabilities and definition of microstates and macrostates. What I wanted to do is go in reverse and start instead with his example talking about the two-state paramagnet. And the reason why I wanted to talk about this is I wanted to help you understand what entropy is, not by talking about disorder or anything like that, but I want you to imagine that energy is randomly moving between possible configurations, okay? So overall, you can't violate the conservation of energy. That's what we've seen in the last chapter. We know that there is a correlation between kinetic energy and potential energy and spring energy and all kinds of different kinds of energy that you can find inside of a system and its temperature, right? And there is a reason why when you take something that's hot and put it in thermal contact with something that's cold, the thing that is hot gets colder and the thing that is cold gets hotter. And this thing that is happening is just simple probability. What's happening is the energy within these systems are randomly rearranging themselves and transferring between one or the other system until it finds the most probable arrangement, okay? Now by most probable, I'm not talking like it's probably gonna rain tomorrow. I'm talking like if you are a human, your mother is probably a human as well. That's like the most probable. There's no other, like no example of humans on planet Earth that aren't mothers, that, that don't have mothers that aren't also human. But I want you to think not just like even that really doesn't help you get a picture of how, how what I'm talking about by probable. I'm talking about so probable that to find a contradiction of this would be to deny the existence of the universe type thing, okay? So uh, we'll get to those huge numbers and you'll see why this is way beyond the scope of the universe to find examples that, that contradict the probability of stuff. So let's talk about this two-state system, this two-state paramagnet. So, in the two-state paramagnet, we're we have to go down to a quantum mechanic level, okay? So just remind yourself really quickly here, a paramagnet, there is three kinds of magnets that you'll find in practice. There's a paramagnet, there's a diamagnet, and there is, of course, a ferromagnet. Ferromagnets, that's what we typically call magnets in you know common day-to-day -day speech, but ferromagnets typically have iron in them and they will maintain a magnetic field after you put a magnetic field on them. So they'll carry the magnetic field. They have like a memory, right? And in fact, ferromagnets were used in iron core or, or magnetic core memory from a long time ago. Paramagnets will uh, try to align themselves with the magnetic field, okay? And so if you have a magnetic field that, that points up, let's say, then the paramagnet will try to match that magnetic field. And then when you take the magnetic field away, it'll have no magnetic field at all. And diamagnets will oppose the magnetic field. And uh, so this is fantastic. Uh, typically this, this effect is very weak in practice. So if you do have material that's diamagnetic or paramagnetic, unless you have very powerful magnets, you won't notice the effect. Okay, so um, let's talk about, okay, so in, in quantum mechanics, things break down uh, to a very small level. And the reason why we call it quantum mechanics is because quantum has to do with counting, right? So you can go down at the quantum level and start to count things, one, two, three, four, five. There is no halves, there's no quarters, there's no eighth or thirds or anything like that. It's everything comes in packets of units. And in this case, we can break things down into uh, magnetic dipoles. Okay, so electrons themselves are dipoles, right? which should kind of like make you think this is very strange. We talk about the spin of an electron. Electrons have charge. And so you're thinking, well, maybe it's just spinning and there's like a current or something like that. No, it's, it's, it is itself a magnetic dipole. So it always has a magnetic field pointing one way or the other. We also can look at groups of electrons in an atom, or we can even look at the atomic nuclei themselves. And we also see that those are dipoles. Whatever the case, there are these things that have a dipole moment. And in a two-state paramagnetic, what happens in quantum mechanically is if we put a magnetic field on these diamagnetics, these, I'm sorry, these, uh, these magnetic dipoles, they, were, they will either align with or against the magnetic field, okay? So the example is that we have a certain number of these dipoles 
I don't know how they're arranged or where they come from, but some of them are going to point up and some of them are going to point down. Okay, and there's a magnetic field B. Okay. Now what we can do is we can count the possible ways that these quantum things arrange themselves. Again, quantum mechanic means that we can count these things with whole units. And so in this case, we have one, two, three pointing up and one, two, three, four pointing down. And there's a certain amount of energy stored in each of these dipoles. If it's pointing with the magnetic field, then the energy is going to be lower than if it's pointing against the magnetic field. And so in this case, we have a little bit more energy stored. Uh, than if everything were pointing in the same direction, okay? And we can look at this, and if we imagine that that energy is randomly distributed throughout the system, we can actually determine how many possible configurations that, that those dipoles can take on. We can count these things. And uh, so that's basically the, the, the equation there is we have this idea of energy that's in a system, and we have this idea of the conservation of energy, and then when we get down to the quantum mechanics, we can actually count the number of ways that this energy can be allocated in the system. Okay, so let's move this away from dipoles and let's go to coins. So you're more familiar with coins. Um, let's say we had three coins, three different kinds of coins, and let's say in this, so let's we have a penny, we have a nickel, and we have a dime. Okay, just three different coins. And we can throw these coins and they can land in one of two different ways. They can be heads or tails, right? So let's write down all the possible combinations. So one combination is that they're all heads. Another is that the penny and the nickel are heads, but the dime is tails, and so on. And if you're familiar with binary, you know how to count all the possible states here. And then T, T, T. And if we count the number of states, we get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We get eight states. Okay. And that, that should make sense because two to the three is eight. Just two times two times two. So there's two options here, there's two options here, there's two options here, and they're independent of one another. So this could be heads or tails regardless of what the others are. Okay. And we're going to call these microstates. Okay. What I mean by a microstate and what this book means by a microstate, it is one possible configuration of all the possible particles in the system. Okay. Now, obviously, when we start talking about Avogadro's number of particles and we talk about very large numbers of quantum states that these things can take on, then the number of microstates are going to get absolutely terrifyingly huge. And we'll talk about how to deal with those numbers later on. But for now, we have eight microstates here. Another way we can look at this is we can count the number of heads, okay? And then we can count the number of microstates. Okay, so there's exactly one microstate that has three heads, this one right here. So this one has three heads. This one has two heads and two heads. So this one has two heads and two heads. This one has two heads. And so we have three possible ways to get two heads. And then we have one, two, three possible ways to get one head. And then there's exactly one way to get zero heads. Okay. And so this is the macro state. We're going to call this a macro state. This number here, we're going to call this the multiplicity. Okay. And the multiplicity, we're going to use the Greek letter omega. Okay, and so in this case, we're going to say omega, the number of heads, equals one of these numbers. It's going to be one or three. Okay, we can write down it is one when n equals three or zero, and it's three when n equals one or two. Okay, so that's our omega function. We can use this to calculate the probability of getting a certain number of heads. So we can say the probability of n heads is equal to the number, the multiplicity of n heads divided by the multiplicity of any heads or zero, okay? Which is just basically all of the microstates, okay? And so we'll get basically 3 eighths if n is equal to one or two, and we'll get one eighth if n is equal to three or zero. 
Okay, that's what we're going to get for this case. Okay, what happens when the number of coins is equal to 100? How do we think about this? Well, we need kind of a formula for counting uh, not just how many possible positions there are. So we, we want to think about the omega of all possible microstates is going to be some number. We want to know how to calculate that. But we want to know what's the omega of n heads. Right? We can't just sit down and count that. We have to have a formula for that. So let's go ahead and derive a formula for that. So first let's consider what is the possibility of getting zero heads. Right? Well, there's only one possible combination all tails, that'll give us zero heads, all right? What about how many different ways can we get one head? Well, we can take each of the coins and say, well, if this coin was the only coin that's ahead and that coin's the only coin that's ahead and so on, so we're gonna have 100, right? There's 100 possible ways to do that, all right? What if we have omega of two? Well, in this case, we have 100 choices for the first coin and then we have 99 choices for the second coin. But we have to keep in mind that the first coin that we choose could be the second coin for another first coin that we choose, right? For instance, I could have chosen number eight and then number three, or I could have chosen number three and then number eight. Okay, so I, I don't wanna count those twice, so I divide by two, okay? And indeed, if you play around with this, you're gonna see that omega three is gonna be 100 times 99 times 98 divided by three times two, okay? And the generic formula, it's going to be one over n factorial. That's that denominator part there. And then we're gonna have n factorial, which is one with capital N factorial, which is 100 multiplied all the way down to one, but we wanna get rid of the n minus n factorial terms, okay? If you're not familiar with this notation and you need a moment to think about this, please, at this point, please take a moment to think about this and why this is, okay? And the only way that, if, if you're having trouble understanding why this is the way it is, one more time, I'm gonna to try to explain this again. Okay, so this n factorial is how many ways to arrange n coins, okay? And this number here, let's use a different color. I should throw away that green marker. This number here is how many ways to choose n from n uh, we're going to say distinctly, okay? Meaning that choosing eight and then three or three then eight is different, okay? Now this formula is very common in probability. It has a name, it actually has a way to express this. And we're going to write N over N like that. And that's going to be defined as capital N factorial over N factorial times N minus N factorial. Now, if you've done my series on basic mathematics, there are two sections where we go over this formula and how it works. Once in the first chapter and once near the end, okay? It's that important, okay? So again, I highly urge you, take a moment and really understand what this formula is saying and how this works. Let's go over a few of the homework problems here. Problem two, one, two, two, and two, three, and two, four. I can't really give you much advice except for on two, one, and two, two, just sit down and just trudge your way through it. It's really not that hard. Problem two, three, okay? This one um, just basically asks you to plug the numbers in and see how the numbers work and what kind of graph you get. You should see something that's vaguely familiar. Um, and problem two, four is taking this problem and doing it a little differently. So two, four has to do with poker. So there's 52 possible cards, okay? Five of those cards will make a royal flush in one suit. Five different cards will make a royal flush in a different suit. And five and a five again for the two other suits, okay? Now, if you were dealt those five cards, you could have been dealt them in any order, 
For instance, you could have gotten ace, king, queen, jack, and 10. Or maybe you got king, queen, jack, 10, ace. Or maybe king, ace, queen, jack, 10. Anyway, there's a number of ways that you could have gotten those cards deal, dealt. Okay, So think about how many possible ways are there to arrange five cards where the order is important and how many ways to arrange five cards where the order isn't important. This should be giving you a big clue on how to count that. If you're having problems with this, I invite you to just count, okay? What is the possibility of getting any particular card for the first card, right? Well, that's one out of 52, isn't it? What about the second card? Well, you've already been given one card, so that's gonna be one out of 51. What about the third card? Now this is one out of 50, right? You see how that works? So take some time on problem two, four. If you can solve problem two, four, you really understand how probability works. If you're having problems with these problems, please reach out to me on Discord. I would love to help you understand these things. But this is kind of really critical to understanding how we're gonna continue from here on out. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this. If you have any questions, please find me on Discord, ask me, and have a great day. Take care and bye-bye.